OK, so uh, hi, everyone. My name is Jeremy Galarno. Um, I'll be presenting about uh, continuous application monitoring using LTTNG. Uh, I work at Efficios. Uh, if you've never heard the name, we're a small consulting firm based in Montreal. We develop tracers, uh, LTTNG being the most known out of them. I personally maintain LTTNG tools and Babel Trace. And I'll start the presentation with a few words about tracing in general and uh, more specifically system tracing and LTTNG. How we struggled to, to have, uh, to, to meet the needs of people who wanted to do continuous monitoring uh, with LTTNG. And our solution, tracing uh, session rotation, what it is, um, and the shortcomings and, uh, and uh, how it makes well, the challenges that are involved in making continuous trace analysis at scale. Um, so LTTNG started in 2005. At this point, it is more of a, an umbrella project. We have a user space tracer, kernel space tracer, um, the system daemons that I maintain to control both tracers and, and control the data extraction paths. Uh, the LTTNG analysis uh, project, which I'll touch a bit uh, later in the talk, it's a set of scripts to work with traces, and LTTNG scope, a graphical viewer. So I got a super great question in the interview uh, in the week before the talk uh, the, that is now on the FOSDEM uh, website. What's the difference between logging and tracing? And really, it's a hard question to answer because there is no clear definition for both. Uh, <laughs> They both have the same goal. So the general goal is I want to extract information from my application or from the kernel and be able to understand the state of the application at that moment. Uh, that's the gist of it. Uh, and, and different uh, logging frameworks and tracers will target uh, either developers, sysadmins, uh, or in the worst case, end users. And um, it's always a matter of trade-offs between usefulness, ease of use, uh, the performance impact on the system and um, verbosity, which ties into ease of use. Uh, and then there are some, um, some concepts will come back in every tracer and every logging framework, uh, enabling only certain subset of events and logging levels. Um, the big difference I find is uh, when people think of system tracers like LTTNG, uh, we're more in the low level events that are very, very frequent. If we think of the kernel tracer, our goal will be to capture system calls and their payload. So we can have thousands of them every, every, thousands of them every second. But we also trace scheduling information. So we track every task running on every CPU at any given time. Uh, and we'll track file system activity, networking activity, power management events, and so on and so forth. In the case of LTTNG specifically, the user space tracer, it tries to be the equivalent for user space. So uh, since we can capture a lot of events with a very low overhead, people will tend to uh, funnel very, very verbose logging through LTTNG UST, and our job is to cope with that. Uh, when I say a lot of events, I want to give you just a rough figure of what that represents. On this laptop, I did a quick measurement while it, while it was completely idle. If you enable all kernel events, that represents around 54,000 events per second. Um, and you're not dropping events at that point. On a busy eight-core server, you're more in the waters of three million events per second. So that starts to be a lot to cope with. And so this is where uh, tracers and loggers are going to diverge in the trade-offs that they have to make. Uh, first trade-off, I'd say the, the, the central part of LTTNG is its, uh, its ring buffer. That's at the center of uh, the whole thing. We have a, ring a lock less ring buffer implementation in user space and in kernel space that are very, very uh, similar. There are only a few adapt uh, adaptations uh, to, uh, to make it work in both scenarios. And it is consumed asynchronously. So there's no locking uh, in terms of, of waiting or blocking an application or the kernel for that matter uh, when you're producing events. So worst comes to worst, you're dropping events. Uh, so you're not slowing down the application. And then there are a number of uh, memory footprint and the security parameters that you can set on that ring buffer, which I'm not going to go into for this talk. And so 
that's one big part. It's the, the quality of the implementation of the ring buffer. The other thing is the best way to not influence the system is to not trace. So trace as little as possible. And this is why uh, in LTT and G we have a very uh, complete set of a rule-based uh, system where you can enable only the events that you want. And you can perform filtering at runtime on the events using our um, interpreter that's running both in the kernel and user space. So I gave two examples here. Uh, the first one, you can see that you're enabling the read syscall. You could enable it for a given process, and then you can filter on uh, the, the size of the read itself and not capture any read of uh, four bytes or things like that. Um, and to give you an idea of the performance, in the kernel space, it's uh, kind of a complicated question I won't go into, but it's pretty much the same performance as, as F-Trace. In user space, uh, we're in the waters of 130 nanoseconds per event. So that's very fast. Uh, as you understand, we can't go uh, through string formatting to achieve that performance, so everything's going to be serialized to a binary file. Uh, if you followed a bit uh, the development of the Linux kernel, we have uh, pushed the, uh, well, we've been working on, on that for a while, but uh, now a restartable sequence, the new system call is in uh, the mainline kernel from uh, 418 and up. And the goal for us, uh, putting that much energy behind that, was to uh, improve the speed and the performance of the user space tracer. So right now, it, the, the code paths that use RSEC are not in LTT and UST, but our prototype branch uh, lowers that number to 90 nanosecond per event. So it's a, quite a significant improvement for us. The users of LTT and G are going to be kernel and application developers and embedded system developers. And for a very long time in the project's history, that was really the core of our users and I'd say all of our users. But now, um, there's, a, there's a lot of interest from people running infrastructure, system administrators, dev, DevOps, and, and those users come to us and say, hey, I've used LTT and G to debug that tiny race in a driver. Uh, they found firmware bugs in their NICs. Uh, they found, uh, you know, understanding why um, there was memory pressure at a given time. So things that, that are hard to reproduce, but that can be reproduced. And uh, so basically what they would do was uh, they would set up tracing, start collecting everything, reproduce the problem, and then investigate manually through the trace. And, and that works. I mean, it's the way the two other classes of users tend to, to work. Um, but um, it's not really continuous monitoring per se. So it's fine if you're hunting for a bug, but if you want to know if everything's running smooth, it's not really the solution. Something clever that I've seen reproduced at a number of uh, our customers' site is that people are going to, uh, people who run a large infrastructure are going to use a sampling approach. So basically, they set up tracing at random times on random machines. They will collect a trace for a given period of time, uh, run a number of scripts on, scripts on that, and they'll look for deviations to their known good uh, response time, resource usage. Uh, they'll look at error rates, error types, those kind of things. But it's not continuous again. So we had the uh, snapshot mode, which is mostly used by embedded developers. And in this mode, you're basically, it's flight recorder mode, basically. You, so you're tracing in memory, you're never touching the disk, and if you figure that something wrong's going on, you can capture your buffers and work with them. And for all intents and purposes, this is going to give you a regular CTF trace that you can use every tool out there that reads that format to work with. But um, there are some drawbacks, especially for, uh, mon for monitoring. I mean, first, uh, it might seem stupid, but you have to react very quickly. Uh, if you're only keeping eight megabytes of uh, trace data uh, around, by the time you realize that there's a problem, there's a good chance that you'll have overwritten everything. So. Uh, no luck. And there's also the problem that if you manage to react uh, fast enough, you only have a few milliseconds of tracings. So you better hope that you're going to be able to understand what was going on with that information. Um, I'm making that sound very negative, but I mean, it's useful in some cases, but it's, it's a major drawback. And then we have the live mode. Um, and live mode was something that we thought was 
good enough for monitoring for a long time. Um, and but really, it was not made for that. It was it was like uh, a way to build. I don't want to say better S trace, but uh, S trace with kernel events that are not syscalls, um, and had uh, user space tracing to that. So you could see what your application was doing and what the kernel is doing, uh, interleave together, and try to understand what is going on. But the goal was to have enough filtering going on that you could actually follow it with your eyes and not work with automated tools. Um, and also, we didn't want to slow the applications. Uh, as, or at least not as much as Ptrace uh, does it. But uh, when we discussed with users who wanted to use that in production, well, uh, first of all, our protocol, and we knew that, is not designed to install a high throughput, so it falls down uh, in those cases. And it's not trivial to consume. There are a couple of people who, who have implemented that, but they're not making it open source. Uh, so it doesn't really exist for, uh, for all intents and purposes. The only client that we have is the text viewer which was for the original use case. And um, also maintaining connections to every target is not really realistic, uh, typically uh, in production, at least not to, for people that we talk to. And there's also the problem that you only get the most recent information. So if you lose your connection, a problem occurs, you reconnect, you lost your, your data, basically. So. It became evident that there were missing pieces for continuous monitoring. Uh, not that we had our head in the sand, but we, we thought, hey, if it makes the job for all of those users, why, why are you special, right? So, and I wanna make a point, uh, because I think there's an eBPF talk after this. Uh, aggregation of system traces to monitor currents is different from what we're, we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is have all the data available if there's a problem that goes on, and not, um, not establish trends or, or uh, make an histogram of latencies and those kind of, th those kind of things, which are very, very useful. I'm not uh, knocking that, it's just the big difference in the approach is, uh, is that. Um, so our modes are good for debugging, but for monitoring, it'll, they don't uh, do the job. So we interacted and we kind of uh, were uh, on the back foot to implement all of that because <laughs> Everyone had a very strong idea of what we should support, uh, and they were all different. And we're, we're not a project that has a ton of resources to throw around. So, for instance, everybody wanted us to uh, support natively their own data store, their own ingest pipeline for logs, or their own message queues. And those are all legitimate ideas, but if we try to support everything, that's the only thing that we're going to be doing forever, right? So we needed to come up with a solution that is adaptable and people can, can roll on their own. There's the problem that traces are huge. Um, there are people who run traces in production and they'll capture hours and hours or days of traces and they don't mind if the traces take hundreds of gigabytes. Uh, those people are few and far between, so this is not a good solution. So we need a way to make it possible to continue tracing but discard the old traces and make it possible to compress traces as they age and, and archive them or, or throw them away. And the third point is that trace processing can be very slow and very resource heavy. When you have hundreds of gigabytes of traces, there's nothing, there's not one tool that's gonna be snappy on that without a bit of preparation. So I think it's, it's a given that the analysis must not happen on a target. Typically, your target is busy doing something. You don't want it to crunch to a hundred gigabyte, a hundred gigabyte trace uh, just out of nowhere. So the solution in, in concept is very simple. We, we thought, okay, so why don't we have a log rotation but for tracing, right? Um, it's not that we didn't think about it, it's just that there are a lot of uh, challenges in implementing that at, uh, with the constraints that we have, and I'll go through those constraints and show you why it was complicated. Um, but basically the idea is we will trace, and then we switch over to new files, and then you can do whatever you want with those files. So then if you want to ingest them in an existing logging pipeline, you can do that. If you want to shuffle them around, you can do that. If you want to compress them, go ahead. Uh, and um, that trace should work with any viewer. That's uh, also a big point, since our format, our tracing format is standard. It's open, it's under the Linux Foundation Diamond Workgroup. 
uh, we don't want to break the format just because we're implementing a new feature. So there's one problem, our format doesn't make this easy. And the reason why it doesn't make easy is uh, twofold. First of all, a, an LTTNG trace is a, is a set of files. It's not one file. So what I said before, we have a lockless ring buffer that we keep per CPU. We also have per CPU stream files. And those CP, per CPU stream files exist for user space and they also exist for the kernel space. And they could exist, depending on your configuration, they could exist for each and every user or each and every application, depending on what you want to do. So it's not, it's not like a classical log rotation where you write, you open another file, start writing there, close this one, and we're done. Um, and we also have a metadata file, and that's one of the big challenges. Uh, because LTTNG is fully dynamic, you can say you, uh, you have an application that opens a shared library, and this shared library has new events. They will have a, a layout that is completely different from what is known up to that point. So you need to add that layout. And we have just a simple uh, event here that has a UID and a cookie file, a uh, uh, payload field. And if you don't know that layout, you can't decode the trace. That's basically the problem. So rotating is a, there's also a step where we have to know, okay, up to that point, what were all the event layouts that were possibly created? We have to serialize that to the metadata file and end that over to the user so that they don't end up with a trace that is not uh, decodable. So the steps become basically as we are tracing, we need to sample a, the production position for every CPU across domains and then establish a switchover point, determine what all the event layouts that we need to decode the trace are up to that point, flush that, and then uh, basically switch over to a new set of files and mark this one as being ready for our consumption. So you can either monitor the file system to see new files being created, or you can uh, use our uh, Unix uh, socket-based uh, notification API to know that. So I'm very happy to say that this works now. It is not in a stable release, although we will be releasing this month. But uh, now it is in release candidate stage, so if you want to try it out, if you find bugs, I mean, uh, hit me up on GitHub or on the mailing list. I'd be very happy to hear about that before we release, although if it happens uh, after, we'll fix it. Uh, and so for a while, we're, we were super happy. We thought, all right, this is done. Because we look at the world from a tracer's perspective, you know. So we thought that all the analysis tools is the job of other people. Um, it doesn't really work uh, like that. People started playing uh, with it, and there were two groups of users. And I'd say there are more people in the first group that were very happy with the feature. Uh, basically, people who do stateless analysis. And stateless analysis is what you do when you just want to count events. So you want to figure out, you have a simple rule, maybe with grep, maybe with something else, where you just want to know how many of those events were there in my trace, how many errors, how many, you know, whatever, and you just need that, and it's fine. And then you can uh, throw that in Grafana or whatever dashboard you use. The other class of users that were less happy were, okay, this is great from a theoretical point of view, but um, I want to perform stateful analysis. So what is stateful analysis? It's basically any time you read a trace and you construct a model. So anything that's, very inter that's gonna be interesting which traces is gonna be, is gonna use that. Graphical view, viewers do that all the time. They basically have a simplified model of the kernel, for instance, and they'll follow every event that comes in. And for instance, if they see a syscall open uh, and, uh, and the open succeeds, they'll see, okay, now that FD number three is associated with that path name. Fair enough. Um, so this is going to make it easy for you to read a trace and understand what's going on without seeing a read on FD number three and having to go back perhaps hours before to see what that file was, if you even have it. And that's the thing with the trace rotation. Maybe that information is in another chunk. So you'll never have that information. So there's a, 
So basically, the, the simplest use case is presenting data in a more familiar way. Uh, even a command line viewer uh, can do that. So instead of having the raw event, we replace the PID with the process name, and we'll replace the FD with the file's name. And this is what, uh, in LTT engine analysis, we do. Uh, I'll present the project a little bit later. But basically, if you want to see the longest read uh, latencies for a process in a given uh, time range, it's going to give you that. It's not going to tell you there was a long read on FD13 at that moment. It's going to give you the file name and the FD. So the way those tools work is that they track state changes of resources. So in concept, it's very, very simple. Um, they have, a, so a, a bit of background, LTTNG is going to, when you start tracing the kernel, for instance, it will dump the state of the kernel. So that means all of the open file descriptors, all the um, active processes, all, well, I should say all the tasks and their PID, uh, group ID, the user namespaces, and all that. So everything's going to be dumped. And the tools can use that as an um, original model that they can then modify by reading the traces. Now, um, what most graphical tools are going to do is track the changes and populate a state history database. And, and they make the reasonable assumption up to this point that all the information is going to be available all the time. The problem with uh, independent chunks is that you don't have a complete model. So, well, you have all the information. It's just split into a lot of tiny, tiny traces. So if you look at a classical LTTNG trace, you're going to be able to follow the whole lifetime of a file. And if you look at chunks, well, maybe you'll see the open in one, a read in the other, and the close in the last one. So if you point existing tools to any of those independent traces, well, they're not going to tell you much. So the challenge became, OK, people are going to have to adapt their tools. Maybe I should try to do the exercise myself and try to help them. <laughs> um, and I thought it would be very easy. Turns out it's not. Um, but there's a demo at the end, and you'll see that it works. Spoiler alert. Um, so LTTNG analysis, we have a number of scripts. Um, the most popular ones are there, system call latencies. There's one to see the interrupt handler durations. Um, IO usage, laten the IS latencies when accessing a file, scheduling latency, so you can see, um, for instance, if uh, you took a long time to answer a request, were you scheduled at all on the CPU during that time? Uh, things like that. So I wanted to re-implement that analysis, but with chunks, and um, basically pro provide the same information as LTTNG analysis. So again, um, that analysis, very simple. You just have to track which syscall is active on, uh, in any given thread at any given moment. When it completes, you can compute the duration, and you can print that, and use the kernel model to pretty print the information. So replacing file names, PIDs, and all that. If we don't have all the information, we need what we've called uh, partial modeling. So basically, the, the central idea of partial modeling is that any kernel object or, or operation, for that matter, can be represented as a span. So the lifetime of a syscall is going to be bounded by the lifetime of the thread in which it happens. The thread is bounded by the process. Um, file descriptors, let's assume that it's bounded by the lifetime of the process and not get into weird clone flags and shared uh, file descriptor tables. Uh, CPUs, the same way. Um, most tools uh, don't, well, most tools assume that CPUs are there all the time, but with CPU outplug, they can come in and come out. So their lifetime is also a span, and then the Linux kernel, that instance, is also a span in time. And the same applies to application. When you're serving a, a request, that's a span, and, and that's not a new concept. I mean, Zipkin represents that information in that way. It's just that for system traces, it's um, not as, uh, as usual. So this is where most analysis need the most adjustments, and I'd say mostly a rewrite, typically, or at least of the back end. So intuitively, uh, I thought, well, the analysis can happen in two phases. First one, I'm just going to go over the chunk, find every um, complete span, and keep that aside. And if there are spans that 
that span over the frontier between two chunks. I'll just keep that aside, and when we do the merge phase, we'll be able to um, stitch that together. And this sounds a lot like a classical map reduce pipeline. Okay, it's a bit more complicated than that, and I realized that very quickly, and it's, it makes a lot of sense if you think about it. Uh, syscalls are not atomic, and system calls can fail. System calls can be interrupted and restarted. So you have to be careful. If you see an open, it doesn't mean that that file descriptor is going to exist at any point in the future. Maybe a system call is going to be interrupted. Maybe it's going to end in the next chunk. So you don't know a lot about it. And your model has to account for that. So you have the example here. Oh, the other point is that can happen on different CPUs. So you don't have to... You have to perform your, ana your analysis not on a CPU stream basis, but on a chunk basis. Fair enough. And we, the, the um, Babel Trace uh, library makes that easy to, to collate all the streams together and, and do the merging. So during the mapping, we find every span. Um, I gave an example here. Maybe we'll see in a chunk that there's a read on FD22. Keep in mind that this could be a socket could be a number of things. The only thing that we know is that at this point, if, it's, if the read succeeds, there was a file descriptor 22. And we succeeded in reading 15 bytes. And we saw the end of the lifetime of that file descriptor. Fair enough. So now we have the end of that lifetime of a file descriptor. Reducing, um, well, to talk about my implementation, basically, at the end of every mapping phase, I'm going to produce a JSON file that has all of the kernel model with the partial spans. And during the reduce, we're going to tie this back together. So at some point, there is a chunk that will tell us, I don't know the FD of that file, but I know that there's a file descriptor that points to this file. It's a block device, normal file. It's not a socket. It's not any, an EPOL file descriptor. And We'll have all the information, and then any request that wanted to use that information is going to complete. I should say the report for a request. That's going to give you the breakdown. Okay, so in fact, it's a bit more complicated than that still. <laughs> um, the rotation is not atomic. So if you look at the model that I had with the CTF traces before, um, well, it's easy to think, okay, I have a switchover point. Now, I, from that point on, I have a new set of traces. It works until you try to do analysis on that. And really, it's simple. If you try to perform the, the switchover without blocking everything, you're going to end up with this staircase pattern where, in time, the rotations happen and you switch files. Um, I thought that this would be very a lot quicker than it actually is, and for a time I thought, ah, it's not the end of the world if we drop events for that little interval. But actually, rotating on a 12 logical core machine is going to take 28 milliseconds. So there's a lot that can happen. There can be uh, complete lifetimes of processes during that time. So, well, processes maybe not, but it could happen. <laughs> But at least files, that can happen, and complete requests can happen during that time. So you can see that what ended up happening is that in some cases, you could see an open on the first CPU, and then a dup on uh, CPU number three. And then you, you think you know everything in that time span, but actually, you're blind to what's happening during the transition. So then you assume that, okay, I know what that FD is, but actually it was something else all that time. So you don't know what that FD refers to. So there are a number of solutions to this problem. The one that I used is uh, a bit lazy, but if you use two chunks, you can seek to a point where you'll have a complete uh, chunk that fits your assumption that the switchover is atomic. I think it's a good moment to mention that we use the same uh, clock source, clock monotonic between kernel space and user space. So this is what makes it possible to make the analysis uh, reliable and really order events in the way that you would expect. So I'm happy to say that the prototype works. Um, <laughs> the goal was to provide the same data as LTTNG analysis. Um, and 
what I wanted to do is have a model of an application uh, that performs a non-trivial uh, query uh, and then show the time that was spent in each phase of the query and then drill down what was the time spent in each and every syscall that happened while serving that phase of the query. Um, and and it try to address the shortcomings of LTTNG analysis. First, it is a lot faster. Um, LTTNG analysis is written in Python. So working with millions of events is not, not what Python is made for. So it's normal that it was slow, but uh, it made it pretty hard to use in a continuous way. Uh, so that part is taken care of, but really the, the challenging part was the partial modeling. So the, the example I'm going to show you, it's a server that receives a request to generate a thumbnail. So basically, it gets given an asset ID. It's going to say, seek to the requested frame, they call the video enough to they call that frame, scale to a thumbnail size, and send the response back. And then we can generate a breakdown of time spent in every syscall. So I have this running in the background. It's feeding a Grafana instance. And basically what you can see here is uh, the time for each and every request. Now, I don't recommend that you do that in production because you don't want to be processing each and every trace chunk and, and, and uh, individually graph each and every request. But it gives you an idea of what, what can be done. The thing that you can do is that if you have outliers like you have here, those points you could generate a report and and drill down into. And this is what we're going to do. If you look at the report generated for one of the fast instances, we can see that, okay, most of the time is spent opening the video with FFmpeg and decoding a full frame. And that's fine. That's the, what most of the work is about. Scaling, as you would expect, is mostly CPU bound. So Opening the file, there's a lot of stuff that goes on, and you can see here that the combined duration of all get TIDs is actually what is uh, dominating that, uh, that operation. Then we have um, a number of calls. I'm not going to go through all of them, but you can see the interest in augmenting the model here. As you can see, normally you would have a read on a FD that you don't know about. You would have M remap um, on FDs that you don't know about. Well, not M remap, but M map, and so on and so forth. Uh, seek, same thing. So seeking, you can see that not a lot happens, as you would expect. This is an indexed video file, so it's fine. Then decoding, nothing unusual. Scaling, nothing happens. It's a purely CPU, uh, it's purely compute and then writing the result to the socket. Now, if we take one example that took a long time, we can see that the outlier is in the right. Actually, this one is not sending over the network because I had some problems here, but uh, it's uh, writing to a plain old file. Basically, you can see that writing doesn't take a long time, but during that time, there was a sync call that took around 600 milliseconds. So that's the kind of insight that you can have very rapidly. Uh, hopefully, your applications don't perform sync uh, during uh, request handling, but it has been seen. <laughs> so uh, in conclusion, I think from the tracer's perspective, we can say that we have the infrastructure to distribute trace processing. Um, people are very, our users are very happy that now they have files and they can do whatever they want with them. Uh, but the open questions that I have for you guys is, um, what form can this type of process processing take that would be integra integratable with existing viewers? Or do you think that we need new viewers, new tools for that? Uh, is there, um, are there tools out there that you guys use to monitor very low level metrics uh, continuously? I, I'd be very happy to, to have your feedback. Otherwise, do you have any questions? All right. Well, thank you. <laughs>